right. keeping up to date with what's the best, what's the latest way to um, make sure that we're analyzing the data in a way that's repeatable and, and we make an accurate assessment of what the data is really telling us to make the best decisions we can. Swinet. It's time for a new era of communication in the swine industry. One that you can get the latest updates while commuting or driving to farms. Here you will have the brightest minds of the global swine industry in your pocket. Swine It Podcast is only possible with the support of forward-looking and innovative companies like Zinpro, Essential Trace Minerals, Exceptional Performance. Every Pig, a simple yet powerful pig health and production management tool. Just All, always one step ahead in swine feeding. Adiseo provides programs and services to help producers achieve their targets in a high-quality, safe, and sustainable way. Alonco's Prevacent, a new perspective. Visit prevacentpers.us to learn more. NutriQuest, experts serving producers and delivering breakthrough solutions. Genesis, the first power in genetics. AB Vista, new nutritional perspectives and novel enzyme applications to drive pig production. Welcome to Swine Podcast. My name is Marcel Gonçalves, your host for today's episode. This episode's sponsor highlight is about Elanco's Prevacent. Isn't it time your PERS protocol evolved? Elanco's Prevacent PERS is safe and effective, offering at least 26 weeks of immunity duration against the respiratory form of PERS. As the first and only on-market USDA-licensed vaccine containing a contemporary Lineage 1 field strain, Prevacent is a contemporary solution. Connect with your veterinarian or an Alan Co. representative to understand how Prevacent can fit your operation. Visit PrevacentPRRS.us to learn more. Prevacent, it's time for a new PERS Spectre. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a bonus episode from the Swine It podcast focused on geeky topics related to swine production. And one of them is designing experiments for assessment of mortality outcomes in pig production. Today, we have Dr. Jordan Gebhardt from Kansas State University. How are you, Jordan? I'm doing well, Marcio. How are you? Doing good. I cannot complain. So a uh, question I have for you, Jordan, is uh, what are challenges and common mistakes associated with mortality experiments? So some of the, the challenges, we'll start with that and, and help to identify and, and understand why mortality and observing differences in mortality for, from the science perspective is just so challenging. The first of that is, in general, and as a production system and as producers and scientists, we want mortality to be a relatively low event. We right. don't want mortality mm -hmm. to occur for, commonly. Right. And being a relatively infrequent event, um, in some examples, the after weaning, the post weaning mortality average in the U.S. industry, about 8%. So overall, that's, that's still a pretty infrequent event. Right. And so in a research setting where we have 20 to 30 pigs per pen and, and over somewhat limited time frames, that relatively rare event often doesn't separate out. And uh, we don't really see nice responses simply because we don't see all that much mortality, which isn't a bad thing by any means <laughs> from a production standpoint. Exactly. But certainly when we're thinking about it from an experimental standpoint, right. it's one of the challenges. Hard to, um, yeah, hard to interpret sometimes, right? Yep, absolutely. So one of the, the other challenges would be that in going back through the, the peer-reviewed literature, what we see mortality is, is quite frequently described and reported in those and they're an important part of those studies, um, whether they're nutritional management or other. But in a lot of cases, the mortality wasn't the primary objective of that study. Right. One example would be evaluating the impact of particle size of ground corn fed to finishing pigs. Mm -hmm. the, the researchers in many cases do the study to evaluate the impact on growth performance. Mm -hmm. They also hypothesize that there could be some differences in mortality and measure and report those values. Mm -hmm. But the, the design from a sample size standpoint and from a conducting the study standpoint oftentimes doesn't have mortality as one of the primary outcomes. Right. A comment yeah. I have on that one is that 
uh, that I would actually uh, make a call here for all the researchers out there and, and, and you know veterinarians and nutritionists is this okay you're going if you're doing a study it's not big enough to pick up a mortality difference you know sometimes that happens right so that's okay but make sure to report because someone else can come later and run a larger meta-analysis and pull all the data now they have enough information so that's one comment absolutely that's a great point that um, and going back to the the absence of evidence does not necessarily mean there's evidence of absence. <laughs> so if we're interested in a certain outcome and we met and we identify that, such as growth performance and and also report mortality, someone else can use that information and pool and congregate knowledge to to come up with meta analysis and larger analysis. So communicating and, and reporting, as you mentioned, is extremely important. And then finally, one of the, the, the last challenges that, that we'll uh, identify and, and put a little bit of thought into is just the limitations with study design. And mortality is an outcome that, in many cases, we need a large sample size to detect meaningful differences. And in the scope of commercial production research or working with uh, industry partners to evaluate various products, various strategies to control mortality, Really, the cost associated with doing a trial large enough to critically evaluate that strategy and really our due diligence from a research standpoint is quite expensive, not only from the amount of animals, the amount of manpower and time needed to take it. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it's often very difficult to do. Right, right. Yes, that, that makes total sense. And any other thoughts here on, on common mistakes before we move to some recommendations uh, on design efficiency or can we yeah so some of the the challenges there as as we mentioned there those are the big ones there are some differences and as we improve our knowledge of statistics and how to design and build statistical models we've learned a lot in and how to apply that towards various non-normal distribution such as a binomial and etc. Um, so we've learned a lot in that area and as an industry it's important to stay current and and be on the cutting edge and moving forward in that direction but that again is a is a challenge that a lot of this is new and if we've been out of our training for quite some time um, right. keeping up to date with what's the best what's the latest way to uh, make sure that we're analyzing the data in a way that's repeatable and, and we make an accurate assessment of what the data is really telling us to make the best decisions we can. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And if you look what happened to the, you know, just computers in general in the last 20 years, you know, it's huge differences. And, and I think some people don't realize that there's a lot more capabilities today to, to get very accurate. Absolutely. So. And it's human nature to, um, based on our training and our experiences, that when we learn that, that's the best there is. Right. But as that grows and develops over time, right. we may not stay current, but yeah. we may be have the assumption that, that what we know in our training truly is the best and most current, while in many cases um, science and technology advance so quickly, um, it can leave us in the dust in many cases. Yes, it's crazy because I look back here three years ago, I consider myself a stats expert now talking to you and Karini, <laughs> Veer and others, I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's a, it's a fast moving area um, and there's a lot of bright minds and a lot of smart people um, thinking about these questions. Very cool. Genesis is the largest independent producer of high health registered purebred swine in the globe, having over 80% of all registered purebred breeding stock in Canada. The Genesis genetic program uses genomic selection strategies focused on productivity, faster growth, efficiency, high yield, and meat quality. To know more, go to genesis.com. G E N E S U S dot com. For knowledge and news from the global swine industry, access our partner, thepigsite.com. So, what are your recommendations for design efficiency? 
So the big one, and or there's several that are pretty important, one of which is, is making sure we're accounting for the data structure itself. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, we need a large sample size to detect those differences. So we'll have animals in multiple barns on multiple sites um, in different regions to get enough uh, replication and enough power to detect what we're trying to do evaluate. So in doing so, it's really important to account for that data structure. Right. Um, and that's uh, it goes back to a uh, research reproducibility standpoint and making sure we're appropriately accounting for everything to make sure we're making the best decisions possible. And in doing so, and uh, creating and designing and coming up with experiments, conducting a power test before we do a study, obviously is very important to know. Do we need 100 animals or do we need 100,000? Right. It's a, a very different question and, and right. very important before we get into it. And as we make these more these studies more complicated and incorporate different aspects of design structure, different barns, different sites, different blocking factors, et cetera, accounting for all of that within a power test is actually pretty difficult. It's not a the straightforward, you have the mean and measure of standard deviation and measure of variability, right. and boom, Excel pops out a number for you. Right. Accounting for the data architecture, data structure is quite complicated. And we've, we've been doing some work and have trying to develop some SaaS-based programs that, that can help address this and help provide an answer. There's still a lot we need to, to work on in this area, but we certainly think we're making progress. Very nice. Yeah, very, very cool uh, area right there for the geeks in our audience. Uh, and like you said, you you continue to work on that arena to get more uh, SaaS codes and other things to help whoever uh, is running those sorts of uh, power tests. And um, yeah, uh, one comment I have is just going back to the basics you know, let's make sure we are randomizing, right? Absolutely. <laughs> yep. That's another point that, that you bring up and, and making sure randomization occurs and, and making sure that, that you do it in the right way. Um, again, all these problems and all these challenges, if we don't do things a certain way, can lead to research reproducibility issues. Yes. We see one response, and then if the study is conducted again, yeah. that response may not be seen. So based on our results, we may not be making the, the correct most um, current or best recommendations based on what we do. So it, it's a challenge to do everything correctly and stay up to date. But again, it goes back to making sure we're making the best decisions based on the data we have. Right. And one thing is interesting. I mean, sometimes when, I, when I'm chatting with someone and we're talking about randomization, uh, it doesn't have to be super complicated, right? Meaning, I know a lot of times we do in Excel, right? But it can be a hat with a few pieces of paper, the biggest thing, of course, if you're not blocking, but it's just a, you know, a completely randomized design, yep. but the biggest thing, it's some unbiased and independently related, uh, you know, absolutely uh, allotment yep. versus, hey, one side of the barn versus the other side of the barn, all right? That's- Yeah, uh, and in the, in, in, in the scenario like that, and sometimes it's difficult with logistics of conducting a study and feed lines and different things, right. but, but the the goal of that randomization is to avoid various confounding factors. Is that the ventilation on one side of the barn is just a little bit different than the other? The sunlight coming through right. the windows and the shades, and, and and those sources of confounding, we can either identify them something like that that it, it seems plausible, right. or it could be something that that we absolutely have no idea no exists idea. but is actually there. So the exactly. randomization it doesn't need to be complicated, like you say, yeah. but it's a, a critical part part of conducting experiments. Right. Very good, John. I really appreciate that. Any final thoughts here on this topic of design experiments uh, for assessment of mortality? I think it's an area that, uh, that we're directing attention towards and trying to come up with some practical solutions that people can use to help make decisions. Um, certainly an area where we have a lot to learn, um, but the, the goal of all of this is to make sure we're conducting research appropriately and to make the best production decisions we can for the swine producers. Very nice. Really appreciate your time again, and we'll be in touch. Thank you very much, Marcio. I've enjoyed it. Hey, everyone. Please share our episodes with as many people as you can so we can continue to impact the life of swine professionals from around the globe with the wisdom of our great guests. 
Before you go, make sure to get in our waitlist for the Swine Talks web conference, the first online conference of the global swine industry, an update on hot topics, and we're even going to have some controversial topics of the global swine industry. So you can leverage that knowledge in your day today. Go to swinetalks.com and get on our waitlist. We'll talk soon.